little pre-show time. Here a little early. I don't know if Pastor John ever goes on seven minutes early, so I'll go seven minutes early just to make sure that, you know. Super cool. Just got notification that I went live. <laughs> are you watching, Jen? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Sharon, how are you? kind of far behind me like you're gonna mess up you're gonna mess up my jam it's up to you I don't know why you would watch. I mean, you're going to hear it like live, <laughs> like live, live, Jen. I'll get some water. I'll be right back. Excuse me, sorry. A couple more minutes. All right. Hello, Kathy. Hello, Craig. Hello, Peggy. 
Marlene and Ernie, welcome. Hopefully everybody is uh, doing well today. <laughs> it's just water, Craig, I promise. <laughs> just water. But I can't tell you after the week I've had. <laughs> All right. This is a really, really odd setup just because when you have Facebook Live going, it uh, makes you kind of small and down in the corner. Heidi, hello. Nice to see you. So, yeah, it, you're kind of small and itty bitty down in the corner if you want to be and but it has all the comments and stuff over to the side. So that's pretty cool. All right, 730. So we'll wait just a couple of more minutes and uh, then we'll get started on uh, shallow soil, the uh, Pastor John's on vacation edition. <laughs> so kind of looking forward to it. Very exciting. Karen Clark, hi. There's a lot of, a lot of folks saying hello. That's awesome. So. All right. So. For those of you who don't know me or you see me and you see me before and I look familiar, my name is Brandon Spaulding. Uh, I've been a member of Shepherd of the Hills for the past mm, six or seven years. Uh, I was a, a member at Shepherd uh, back in the Pastor Mike Brewer and Jason Haynes days right at the beginning of when uh, uh, Pastor Kevin came on. Uh, and then I went to St. John Covina for a little while and now I've come back to uh, Shepherd of the Hills and I could not be more excited to, to be here. Uh, I'm the vice chair of the congregation. Um, I uh, assist with meetings uh, sometimes when Sherry is uh, when Sherry is away, but uh, most of the time when Sherry's running meetings, I just sit there and look pretty because that's what I do. Uh, <laughs> And then uh, I'm a, I was the chair of uh, Pastor John's call committee, which was an excellent time. And uh, so uh, tonight um, I talked to him a little bit about uh, taking on shallow soil because uh, I didn't want a Thursday to go by without one. Uh, the last uh, two were um, incredible before the Monday Thursday service. And uh, if you were there for the Monday Thursday service last uh, Thursday, um, one of the most amazing, uplifting experiences of my uh, entire faith journey life. Um, the ability to uh, do at-home communion was absolutely incredible. So uh, uh, I thought I'd say thank you to uh, Pastor John um, and uh, also to uh, the congregation of Shepherd of the Hills to just let me uh, do this uh, for this evening. So um, without further ado, uh, Thursday night shallow soil is about questions more than anything else. And uh, what better topic to deal with questions than doubt? And uh, we are living in a time right now where uh, doubt is everywhere. I don't know what's gonna happen to me tomorrow. I don't know what's gonna happen to me uh, next week, next year. Um, <laughs> you can watch the news if you're brave enough and uh, see if uh, there's something there that might uh, get you to believe something or other, but uh, really uh, doubt is everywhere in our life. And uh, the resurrection of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday was an incredible, incredible uh, experience and time for the disciples and all of his family and all of his friends. And uh, in, after his resurrection, uh, there were quite a few people who were lucky enough to, to get to see uh, Jesus as he was uh, walking around and, and talking with people. But the, the one man that everybody kind of sort of focuses on is, uh, and he kind of gets a bad rap, is Thomas. And uh, Thomas was uh, one of the disciples 
uh, one of the 12. He was just unfortunate and was not able to get to see Jesus um, until um, one very, very interesting um, uh, meeting in a, in a room, in a closed room one day. Uh, and so what we're going to talk about tonight and, and mostly our, our idea, our, our main idea, is the concept of the role that doubt can play um, when it draws us closer to the person of Jesus. Um, the question remains for us all is that what does Thomas's story teach us about doubt? And so uh, our passage for this evening is from John chapter 20, uh, verses 24 to 29. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to read that in the English Standard Version, but uh, much like John, Pastor John allows us to do, you can read along in whatever version you like, but uh, we're going to go to John chapter 20, verses 24 to 29. And uh, that scripture says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it into my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so, we ask ourselves, what does the role of Thomas and his doubt play in our relationship with God? But also, what does Thomas's almost expectation that we are expecting to see things before we believe them, what does that teach us about who we are and the faith that we have? And so just want to kind of throw it out there right now uh, to you guys and, and ask your, so, some questions about what are your views on, on doubt and how does doubt either positively affect your faith or negatively affect your faith? Anybody? Because I can tell you that um, most of us, I don't know, do we look down upon doubters? I mean, is it really the expectation that we should just blindly walk through any and every door and, and just say, you know, yeah, I'm going to do it? Because, I mean... I don't know. And I'm, I'm an educator. I've been an educator my entire life. And, and most of the time we're talking about how do we prove things? Well, I mean, what's the easiest way to prove something? One, you, you utilize your, your senses, your eyes, your ears, your nose. I mean, I've been lucky enough to have a couple of uh, babies that have been born into uh, either my, my close family or my, my social circle. And I can tell you right now, I mean, how do babies learn anything? Mostly they just stick it in their mouth. That's kind of sort of <laughs> what they do. But I mean, they're just, they're utilizing any and every sense that they have to prove that what is being shown to them or what is being taught to them is, is what's real. And I mean, I don't know, we can look at it from the, the idea of he's left out. I don't know how many of the disciples were left out. It, it says uh, Thomas was not with them. It doesn't say however many of them were there and how many of them were able to see the Lord, but uh, he wasn't there. 
And uh, I mean, I don't know, in society today, we now have this thing called FOMO, which is the fear of missing out. And I can tell you right now, what a bummer to be the one disciple that didn't get to see the resurrected Lord after he came out of the tomb for being crucified. Um, and I, I think that that's interesting. Uh, Craig says, hasn't doubt entered all our thoughts to approaching blind faith? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's hard. You gotta, how do you convince, how do you convince people of things? I mean, if, if everything is a, a, a continuum and, and everything is on a line, uh, I mean, most of us are lucky that our kids believe just about everything that we say from the get go. Um, they, they, they trust us and, and is, is it, well, that's a really good question right there that kind of came out of this. I'll throw this out at you, at you guys too. Is, is Thomas's doubt a lack of trust? And basically, who is it a lack of trust in? Is it a lack of trust in his fellow disciples? Or is it a lack of trust in the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to be back in three days, and it's been three days, and people said they saw him, and Thomas didn't see him. So I'm interested to, uh, to hear your thoughts on that. Is it, is it a lack of, of trust? And, and really, who is that lack of trust in? Because, I mean, um, I'm the principal of a school, about 845 kids. And my job every day is to make them believe wholeheartedly that they can trust me. Trust me to take care of them. Trust me to keep them safe. Um, trust me to make sure that their teachers are going to do the right things, that their classmates are going to do the right things, that, that all of these people that are in their life are, are going to do the right things. And so what we're really looking for here is, is you know, an answer, a, a solid answer that we can believe in. And uh, wow, lucky me, <laughs> my dad, my dad has decided to show up to shallow soil, soil on Thursday night. So uh, thank you, dad, for, for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope that you'll be here every Thursday night because you're retired and you don't really have anything else to do. Um, but uh, as you can see in the comment section, he thinks that it's a lack of trust in the other disciples. And I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with that, sure. Um, and that his other comment is that doubt, doubt is a degree of faith, not the lack of faith. So interesting. We have another continuum concept there. So, um, I like that. I like that quite a bit. Craig says it's very hard to convince an adult if he or she has not softened, has not softened her heart to God's or to God's spirit. I, I, I can very much agree with that as well. Um, so then I just, I pose this question then, I mean, Thomas is one of the 12 and I mean, he's seen, you know, the, the actions of Judas Iscariot and, and, and how his, his actions led to the betrayal and the crucifixion of, of the Christ. And um, so he's got 11 other brothers that he's been on this journey with for quite a while. And he, you know, he's heard now from them that, you know, the, the Lord has risen. Um, you know, I would say that he, I would hope that he would probably have a, a pretty softened heart uh, toward the Lord. And, and so when we are, are walking in our faith and, and we are, are doing the things that, that we are doing in our daily life, are we, you know, do we, do, do we truly have that softened heart to the Lord? So that's a very interesting point, Craig. So thank you for that. Um, here's another interesting question and I'll type it in right now. And let's just say for the sake of argument that Thomas wasn't the only one. Um, is Thomas asking for anything that the other disciples were not asking for? 
I'm interested. So, because, I mean, when, when it comes down to it, I mean, how many of us really know what's going to happen tomorrow? I mean, we go through our education and we become, you know, educated and we spend time trying to be able to predict things. And I mean, as you can see with what's going on in our world right now, we're, <laughs> we're struggling to figure out what the heck, you know, is going to happen tomorrow. Uh, Craig says the question that is not posed is why did Jesus give what Thomas wanted as proof? Oh, that's fantastic. Um, I will be real honest with you. Um, when I read it, I thought it was extremely interesting um, <laughs> to, to, to say, um, hey, kiddo, uh, in the room with you. It was locked, by the way. Um, and I think that that's a very interesting situation too. Um, I was able to have a couple of different conversations with my dad about this uh, uh, growing up and, and how he got into the room and, and how that uh, kind of sort of shows us a little bit more about what uh, maybe heaven's going to be like and what our, our eternal bodies are going to be like. So I thought that was pretty cool. But he just basically walked in and he told him, you want it? You got it. Here you go. Go ahead, put your hand right there. See that? That's where the nail was. And then actually uh, he goes through and, and tells him, go ahead and put your hand, you know, right here in my side and, and feel where the spear got me. And, and, and I will, I'm, not, I'm not just going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you more than you asked for as proof. And I, I don't know, Craig, my, my response to that more than anything else is, is I, I see God tends to do that especially when um, he really wants us to have something or he really wants us to see or know something. He is more than willing to, to not only give us what we ask for, but then he gives us even a little more than that um, beyond. So um, I thought, I think that's an absolutely fantastic question. So... All right. Well, this is kind of a dominated conversation by uh, a few gents here. So other people uh, looking to kind of chime in here. Um, my dad comes back with it. The other disciples had already seen Christ. They were assured. Thomas needed the same reassurance. His need for reassurance if he was at the crucifixion was well founded from a human, not spiritual need. I like that. Um, so basically what my dad's answer was to the question was what was he asking or anything that the other disciples were not asking for he really wasn't asking for anything more the other disciples had already gotten it they got it in a visual uh, sign that they had seen the lord walking around and and thomas was looking for what those other people had had they just didn't he didn't want to go on hearsay so i like that yay marlene thank you yay marlene Marlene says, Jesus meets us wherever we are in our faith walk. And that is 100% correct. Um, I guess Marlene's response is kind of sort of to Craig's question is that, you know, Jesus gave Thomas what Thomas needed. And maybe the other guys only needed just to kind of see for themselves or to talk with him or anything like that. And Thomas got, you know, that rock solid 100% no doubt answer and I, I and there are some of us that need that um i think that uh that i mean that's 100 percent correct I, that's where thomas was when in his walk and the other disciples were in their walk in a different place and so jesus took care of that and i think that was I, absolutely fantastic fantastic right there yes jesus has omnipresent power which walls do not keep out um yeah, it's it just kind of, I'd be interested to, to see, um, because this is post-resurrection versus, you know, pre-crucifixion, um, if he would have been able to do that before he was crucified, um, but because he was, you know, risen from the dead and, and really getting ready to, 
to you know do his last little bit of ministry here on earth before he ascended into to heaven um yeah but imagine how, how amazing that would have been you know i'm pretty sure those dudes were locked in that room because they wanted to be um they were they were probably being looked for um being looked at and and there's a lot of time that they were probably pretty nervous and um i mean just and i mean no detail goes unnoticed um in scripture but i mean i and i know i guess that's part of the reason why i was really uh very happy that the lord led me uh to my career in english language arts and, and reading and stories and how to put those things together because to be real honest with you i mean when the author puts words into a book or a paragraph or a sentence they're almost always carefully chosen and and for them to to very specifically talk about the locked door um just basically meant it wasn't for everybody to come in and the one person that needed to come in came in and and did exactly what uh he needed to do uh craig says but when it comes down to it all the disciples relied and believed the uh, re, uh, relied and believed the women returning from the tomb um yeah very much so um you know uh, i mean it's an interesting situation um I mean, I just pose a hypothetical to you right now. I mean, Jesus says that when he comes again, that every eye will see and every ear will hear. Um, and I always wondered how that was going to happen, you know, coming out of the sky down to the Mount of Olives. And then, you know, I don't know, I don't know, seventh, eighth grade year, somebody said, well, I mean, that's what TVs are for. And I went, wow, that's, you know, very simple, but, you know, also very revealing is that, you know, but let's just say you weren't watching TV at that point in time and somebody calls you on the phone and said hey jesus is back he's he had, uh, i saw it on tv well first thing you're looking to do is probably going straight to the television set to see if you can see it you know and even if this is a trusted friend i mean somebody who has your cell phone number that dialed it that it doesn't say scam likely on it you know but you pick up that phone and you say hey you know hey, what's going on like I, he's back jesus is back i saw it i saw it on tv like you're gonna go looking for that footage Every single one of us is going to go looking for that footage because that's what we need to see because we want to see it, I think, but also just to believe that what we've been looking for this whole entire time is actually, you know, coming true. And, and maybe that's part of what Thomas was saying. You know, I really don't want to get my hopes up. I really want to, I really want him to be back. And I really want to know in my heart that I'm that I'm, I'm ready to, to do this. I'm, I, I'm or that I'm ready for him to be back. Connie, welcome, welcome to the conversation. Connie says to have witnessed Jesus' agonizing death, it would have been hard for any human being to grasp his resurrection. And I think that that is absolutely one hundred percent correct. Um, you know, being able to 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 grow up in a in a Lutheran school and to uh, to go to school um, and to, to have um, you know religion class every single day growing up, and then Sunday school on Sunday mornings, um, and then youth group on Sunday mornings, and, and to grow in, in all of this, you know, I remember a whole lot of things about what I was taught, and and one of my teachers told me that the reason why the Romans, you know chose crucifixion was because you didn't survive it. Like it was unsurvivable. You weren't, you weren't making it. It was a guaranteed, you know, end, whether it took days or hours, it was, you know, no one, no one was making it back from, from that. And, and so to be able to, to witness that and, and to know that, you know, your Lord and Savior who said he was, you know, the God, you know, the Son of God to, to die on the, on the cross, I think was was probably very, very difficult for all of them to deal with. Um, I can't imagine that it would have been, you know, because I mean, for every other human that went through it and everyone that's gone through it since, nobody's gotten up three days later and, and walked out of the tomb but him. And so I, I could absolutely 
see that right there. I, I then I pose another interesting question here: How much does circumstance of the situation determine your level of doubt in regards to any particular, you know, thing that you want to believe? I mean, how how much does circumstance play a role in that? I think that's a very, very interesting, you know, question to, to, to think about. And then uh, here's another interesting uh, thought. Um, no, I, I, once again, I, Craig, Craig brings up a good point, and then I'll point it back to Marlene, is that 10 of the disciples did grasp the resurrection without being a direct witness of the event. They, they, they believed with, when they heard it. And so I just, I'm going to go back with Marlene on this one and, and think that I think it was because maybe Thomas wasn't there in his faith walk. So that's, that's pretty good, but very, very astute observation there. Um, here's an interesting question. What's the difference or is there a difference between doubt and disbelief? Because earlier, um, my dad dropped in a uh, doubt is a degree of faith, not the lack of faith. And I'm interested, is there, is there really a true difference then between doubt and disbelief? Is, is Thomas saying, I can't, I won't believe it until I see it, disbelief? Or is it a contingent belief? Because I, I, I actually think that's pretty interesting. I mean, is there such a thing as contingency belief? Yeah, I trust it. Yeah, I've heard the stories. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'd ask any kid on Christmas Eve. There, I mean... There's contingent belief <laughs> that Santa's coming, you know, and, and whether or not, you know, Santa is going to come through. And, and I mean, is that part of the excitement on Christmas morning for kids that what you believed or wanted to believe wholeheartedly actually came true? Um, I, I, that's pretty cool. I, I think anyway. I don't know. Thoughts? Ah, contingency belief is more head than heart. Interesting. Contingency belief is more head than heart. Well, yeah, I mean, it, I mean, for us as human beings, I mean, it's hard to wrap our head around some things. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we go through a bunch of different situations every single day. You know, I want to believe that... <laughs> You know that school is going to reopen in a normal way in in August, but I don't know. I mean, I, I want to believe it. I want to believe that that's what the people who say that that's what they want to have happen will actually happen. But I don't really know if I believe that. Um, deep down in my heart, you know, I I it I think it's based on what we have seen. It's based on our experiences. It's, it's not a, I don't think, a lack of faith. But I, I do think that it's a lack of, of I don't know, trust in, in what I've seen. And maybe that's a little bit of what Thomas is talking about here, is that it, maybe it's not a lack of trust in what he's seen. Maybe he's seen so much of what Jesus can do that he just can't wait to see this one thing. I think that's, a pretty, that, that's pretty interesting right there. Faith is heart, not mental. Once we try to define our faith, we marginalize God's ability to work in our lives. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I'm not saying that. What I'm, I, I think most of us have, have seen the Lord get us through the greater majority of, of things that our head told us wasn't going to work out. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I don't know if it's a marginalization of God's ability to work in our lives other than... but. Well, I don't know. I, that might actually be a good word for it. 
Um, so I'm interested. I'm going to think on that. That's, that's interesting. Marlene says disbelief is a stronger statement than doubt. You have already made up your mind to not believe. Interesting. Yeah. Well, what if you see something that changes your mind? Does it go from disbelief to belief? Or you're still there? I mean, what about, what if you're, I mean, what if you're confused about what you saw? What if you're sitting there going, I've never seen anything like this before and I don't know what to think at this point in time. I think that's an interesting concept as well. Very, very, very cool. Is disbelief final? Or can it come back? Can you, if, is, is that, is it, because if you've made up your mind to not believe, is there any way to recover from that? Interesting. All right. Um, oh, but Satan constantly tries to get us to think we are able to solve our own problems and that we don't need God to help us. Very nice. Um, absolutely. Um, he's just always driving that wedge, doing that, doing what he can to, to get us to, to start to think that we are able to do things for ourselves. Absolutely. Craig says everything in the left world, I doubt, uh, in, and I have much disbelief. However, in the right world and in my faith, I have no doubt Jesus was sent to die and is the resurrection on the day and that specific day and that prophecies by many in the old Testament. Absolutely. Um, I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, everything that I see in the world today doesn't ever change the fact that I, I don't believe that that he's coming back or that any and all of those things actually happened. Um, as I was getting prepared for this, I was thinking about it because it's like, you know, you talk about Thomas and you talk about, you know, doubt and the role that doubt, doubt plays in faith. And, you know, I go back and I look at it and it's just like how many different times and opportunities did the Jews have to, to, you know, just follow what God said based on the things that he had already done for them. And then they didn't do it and they wanted a sign and he gave it to them anyway. You know, you know, Moses part, I, I think when Moses parted the Red Sea and the, the, you know, the Israelites were able to walk across a body of water on dry land um, and they looked and they looked right and it was all separated for them i just i don't <laughs> i don't know how that i mean that you want to talk about seeing to believe that's incredibly that's got to be a sight that you don't forget so how do you lose that 40 years walking around in the desert you know i mean i, I don't know if i was moses i'd continually point back to that like hey remember that one time you know because <laughs> i mean that's i i just don't i don't i don't know sometimes doubt and, and, and doubt's role, it kind of confuses me from time to time. Marlene, yes, you can reverse your disbelief. God never gives up on you. He's there still working on your heart. Absolutely. So, yeah, you can change your mind. You can change your mind back and because and, that's what, I mean, you're supposed to do. You're supposed to put out your beliefs and then you're supposed to look at, you know, the evidence as such. And then you're supposed to make an intelligent decision based on, uh, all the things that you find. Um, yes, Craig, you are absolutely correct. The Jews had a terrible habit of shooting the messenger. <laughs> and the messages to boot. Yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like, I, I, I don't quite know how Moses, you know, did it. I know that they talk about the patience of Job, but I'll tell you right now, the patience of Moses had to be pretty spectacular. So um, I got a couple other things before... Uh, I, uh, I wind this up for um, the evening. We've been around, we've been on for about 30, 30 plus minutes. And so um, Jesus' question to Thomas in verse 29, is that helpful? And his question was, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? And, and I think that is, is that helpful for us? You know, Brandon, do you believe because, you know, I made sure that you had 
food on your table and you had enough you know money to put gas in your car to get to work that you got up the hill and down the hill like how many more things do you need to see in order for you to believe that i can do the things that i told you i'm going to do is that is that question that he asked you know is that helpful for us today because in the end i think that just because we see something doesn't always guarantee that we'll believe it. Is it the consistency of seeing it? Is it, does it go back to being a trust factor again? Um, you know, when you hear the words echo in your mind, oh, ye of little faith, you know, again and again and again, you know, we are very lucky that, uh, that Marlene is correct, that we have a, a loving and caring God who never gives up on us and he's always working on our heart and, and he's always willing to show us, you know, in multiple ways again and again, that he loves us, that he cares about us and that he wants to take care of us. And we just have to, to trust and, and not to doubt what he is doing for us. And really, ultimately, what I think that that does is it gives us to have the Thomas moment. Verse 28, the second half of 28, where Thomas asked my Lord and my God. <laughs> I mean, talk about a come to Jesus moment. There you go. I mean, you got it in spades right there. I mean, he, he if, if that's what it took though, to get Thomas there, then I'm pretty sure that Jesus was not upset about it. Um, I don't know, maybe he was a little bit disappointed. Maybe he was a little bit, you know, like, <laughs> come on, man. Like uh, the door was locked and I'm here, but still it's cool. He doesn't even address that particular part too. It doesn't even say that he had a conversation when he walked in the door. He just basically walked in and said, yo, Thomas, come here. I got something for you. And then he just took care of him like he does with all the rest of us. So I didn't mean to skip your, uh, your, your comment there, Heidi. I agree that you can return from disbelief. I know people who have come back to God and uh, absolutely, just like Marlene said, he's always working. He's always putting that work in. And then Craig talks about the, the Old Testament full stories when studies reveal that men are consistently putting themselves above the Lord. You know, I do it myself as a problem solver in, in you know, isn't the Old Testament, isn't the Old, the Old Testament a testament to the Lord's continual love for his creation? Absolutely. Like I said, I, there's, there's so much love and patience in, in, in the Old Testament, in, in all aspects of it, you know, and I mean, those are probably, you know, other nights of, uh, of shallow soil, but I'll tell you what, I'd love to have a couple conversations about David, um, really. The, the man after God's own heart. And, uh, I got a couple of questions I'd like to ask Pastor John about David. So um, I might get into his ear about that. But but really the, the come to Jesus moment that Thomas had where he said, my Lord and my God, he had all the proof that he needed. And uh, hopefully, you know, for us, we can have those moments too. So that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be you know, that two by four to your head, you know, or the, the, the constant, you know, shaking to, to tell you, wake up and pay attention. And, you know, I mean, just turn around and look back on all the things that I did. Oh, that's not good enough. Okay. Well, here's something else. And, and I just, I see that, that the Lord is continually blessing us and he's continually giving us opportunities to see him show us how much he loves us so that we can have that come to Jesus moment where we can confess my Lord and my God um, without any doubt or any disbelief whatsoever. So, all right. Well, I can tell you that this was probably one of the coolest things I've ever done. Um, I mean, I've been having Zoom meetings left and right. I've been looking at screens for days and days and days. Um, you know, and, and, but this was really cool. And I appreciate uh, you guys for coming out tonight. Um, 
even though Pastor John wasn't here, um, he was here in spirit. Um, and uh, actually, uh, he's, he was here on my t-shirt too. So everyone will see this. And if you know Pastor John, you actually, you'll learn a little bit more about the frame pretty quick because uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about it uh, as a congregation. But uh, um, I asked him to do this and uh, he gratefully obliged me. And, but uh, he gave me the foundation and he told me, hey, um, you know, this is what we're going to look at, but you can kind of talk about it, make it your own. And so some of the questions that I asked were some of the questions that he asked because they were really, really good questions. And some of the questions that they, that I asked were some things that kind of came from my own ideas and such. But uh, Craig, I'm very appreciative for you. Dad, thanks for coming out. Heidi, thanks for coming out and, and, and adding in. Marlene, always absolutely fantastic. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, everybody who had a comment or wanted to talk for a little bit about this. Um, oh, Sue. I love it. Hi, Sue. Um, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate that. I uh, Yeah, it's been a week, man. I'm telling you, we are, uh, we are in a different spot out in, uh, out in the education world. And so... Um, us all in your prayers, if you would. Um, all the teachers that are out there, um, they are doing an absolutely bang up job. Um, they have taken the ball and they have run with it um, in a way I can't even express to you. Um, you know, some people are like, oh, well, they had a whole week to prepare. <laughs> That's comical. And we can talk about that at a different time, child soil too. But, uh, you know, but yeah, keep us all in your prayers. Um, and, and keep thinking about us. Keep the essential works and prayers. Those people are absolutely knocking it out out there. Truck drivers, delivery people, all the people that go to work every day so that we can have food. Um, and if possible, continue to support your your, your local economies um, and, and the restaurants that are doing takeout and stuff like that um, just because they need it. Um, the people on the front lines, um, I got a cousin who's a respiratory therapist. Um, <laughs> I, I got a really good friend whose sister is an RT. I mean, there are, are hundreds of thousands of, of, of medical workers that are out there right now that are absolutely just knocking it out for us. And, um, and we're, we're doing a real good job. Um, and, and so stay inside, stay safe, take good care of yourselves. Um, I cannot wait until we can all congregate again in, uh, in Chapel East and, and, and listen to uh, Pastor John uh, greet us on a Sunday morning with a y'all so that I can say, so, <laughs> so uh, thanks for all of the uh, kudos and the thank yous. And uh, I'm hoping against hope that uh, I'll be able to uh, do this for uh, John again sometime. So uh, take care, everybody. Uh, love you guys. Pray for you guys. And we will see you uh, soon. Bye-bye.